Hello and welcome from my side. I'm Tamara Badekuber and this is my friend and musician colleague Michael Reitinger. And we are going to play some songs for you tonight. I also studied at the WU. I did my bachelor's program here. And I took part in WU's talents last year. And it's always an honor for me to come back and take part in different events. So I hope you enjoy it tonight and have a great evening. We. Yeah. <laughs> She calls out to the man on the street Sir, can you help me? It's cold and I know where to sleep Is there somewhere you tell me? He walks on, doesn't look bad He pretends he can hear that's a whistle as he crosses the street Seems embarrassed to be there Oh, think twice Cause there's another day for you and me in paradise Oh, think twice Cause it's another day for you about it She calls out to the man on the street He can see she's been crying She's got the blisters on the soles of her feet She can walk but she's trying Oh Cause it's another day for you and me in paradise Oh, think twice Cause it's another day for you You and me in paradise I think about it Nothing more anybody can do Oh, Lord There must be something you can say Oh, think twice Cause it's another day for you and me in paradise Oh, think twice Cause it's another day for you, you and me in paradise. Just think about it. Just think about it. Just think about it. Thank you, Shim. Thank you very much. So, dear guests, dear students, the U community, colleagues, but of course, most of all, dear Christopher and family, I, I'm very happy to welcome you at VU Vienna. I normally would say at the most beautiful university of the world, right? <laughs> So before we start into this evening, I would like to give you a brief overview on today's events and some facts and figures uh, about VU. Today's ceremony is part of VU Matters, VU Talks. With this series, VU created a platform 
for exchange and discourse between academia and the public. Socially and economically relevant topics are presented to the public and takes place once a week. Traditionally, the title VU Manager of the Year is awarded once a year during this event. Hence, at the beginning of the evening, we will celebrate the ceremonial awarding of the title VU Manager of the Year 2022. The presentation of this award is always very special because VU is honoring outstanding achievements of exceptional managers who are VU alumni. Now I can see some disappointed faces uh, realizing just now that they have chosen the wrong university. <laughs> Sorry for that. But there is another chance you could go to our executive academy, graduate from there, then you would qualify as VU alumni and would be a candidate for this VU manager of the year. Our VU alumni, we are identifying as managers of the year, have very exceptional careers. They have international experiences and distinguish themselves through exemplary work within and outside their company. These are the four criteria for selecting someone uh, for this award. After the award ceremony, we will continue the evening with a brief lecture by our award recipient on the economics of equality and a panel discussion. So Christopher Schleffer will discuss with Anjula Baiz, Chair of the International Board Amnesty International, Karin Heitzmann, Professor and Co-Director of the Research Institute of Economics of Inequality at WU, and Rem Kohlhaas, of course, uh, well known of all of us and also professor in practice at Harvard University. And the discussion will be moderated by Michael Kötrich of the Presse. And as you already heard, the evening was opened by Tamara Badegruber. Thank you very much for joining us. She's one of our VU talents we are very proud of. Welcome. Now, let me say a few words about VU and its campus so that our guests get a better idea of the place we have, where we have come together today. The campus of VU has over 100,000 square meters of net floor area. And six international architecture firms were involved in this construction. After a four year construction phase, we moved to the new campus in 2013. And I might add that the project was completed on time and on budget. <laughs> VU has an annual budget of around 170 million euros and employs more than 2,500 people, 1,700 academics and over 800 administrative staff. And currently VU has around 21,000 students. In many ways, our campus reflects some of our key principles we stand for. Let me just mention one. Namely that our, one of our main responsibilities of a university, and of course also of VU, is to provide its students with an academic education while allowing them to grow and to, to develop personally. And exactly this is one of our core tasks, and that's why we positioned the Library and Learning Center, or LC, the impressive building we are holding this ceremony today, was, was placed in the heart of the VU campus, in the, in the center, surrounded by all other buildings. The Library and Learning Center was designed, and I guess Rem is very happy to hear this, by Zaha Dit. So we are very proud of our campus, and I think this is the right location for today's event. But now to the occasion of this evening, the awarding of the title VU Manager 2022 to Christopher Schleffer. I know 
you would prefer a VU entrepreneur, right? Hmm. But you have to be happy with the VU manager of the year, sorry. <laughs> but maybe we kind of renamed this award, you know, but that's, that's another story. So why Christopher Schleffer? A few short facts because the actual laudatory speech is still up to come. After completing his degree program at the Vienna University of Economics and Business in 1993, actually I will not tell of the audience how, how long it took to graduate from VU Vienna. <laughs> he began his career at Accenture and moved to Deutsche Telekom in 1998. At just 31, he was appointed as chief strategist of what was then Europe's most valuable company and shaped the group's growth strategy in the US and Europe for an entire decade. In 2006, Christopher took over operative responsibility for the global product portfolio as divisional board member, product and innovation. And at the same time, he managed all of the group's internet business models as chairman of the board of T Online International. In 2007, he and Tim Cook signed the first exclusive partnership for the iPhone outside the United States and the first telephone based on the Android operating system in New York uh, was, uh, um, sorry, the first cell phone based on the Android operating system in New York was in 2008. In 2010, Christopher switched to being an entrepreneur. And today he leads in the London-based technology company of Nyum. Christopher did not only hold an impressive and important positions. He is also, and this is one very special thing we are asking for our VU alumni, he is highly committed to social responsibility. He is a member of the global board of directors of Amnesty International, patron of I Am The Code and founder of Activism Group, a social enterprise for economic, social and gender equality. And of course, this is still not enough to become VU Manager of the Year. He also serves on the International Corporate Board of VU and provides valuable advice to the Rector's Council. So now, before we proceed any further thought, let us watch a very short film together, please. The education I received at VU really laid the foundation for my professional career. Uh, you know, it helped me understand principal things in business and economics, and I could always draw on them. But I think uh, it is also the time of character building when you're at university in a life, and I think that is what I even value higher than you know mere education. I am Christopher Schleffer. Uh, I'm a tech entrepreneur based in London. I'm also a father of two grown-up daughters and a little toddler. To be recognized by the Vienna University of Economics as a manager of the year is an honor. I remember vividly uh, in my student days when that award was the first time uh, being presented to somebody and it was uh, the president of Austrians Caritas, an NGO, Helmut Schüller. And it made a deep impression on me. So to now stand in a line with people like Helmut Schüller or Peter Löscher or Johanna Rachinger is a token of appreciation, I guess. Studying at uh, VU was an important time in my life. It really laid the foundation. Uh, it was the time when, you know, you grow up, in a sense, you become independent of your family. You move from the countryside, in my case, uh, of Salzburg to the capital city of Vienna. All is new, all is exciting in a way. Uh, but I guess the most important part really was meeting people who became friends and uh, therefore played a really important role in my life. And then I was working my whole life abroad and it was interesting to cross compare also you know, education from elsewhere and the people I met uh, during my professional career. I have taken a decision some time ago uh, to focus my spare time uh, for humanitarian causes 
and that led me to uh, serve on the board of Amnesty International, but also as a patron of the I Am The Code Foundation. These two organizations are extraordinary in their own right. Amnesty International is of course the world's leading human rights organization now since more than 60 years. And I Am The Code Foundation is an organization found by a dear friend from Senegal, Mariam Yam, who is aiming at teaching one million girls from marginalized communities around the world how to code and change their life in that way. Christopher is a very wonderful man. You know, he's really a nice guy. He's my friend for a very long time. And I think he he's almost like my mentor. He's my friend. We are peers. Uh, you know, we have a lot of conversations. But he's like almost the papa of the organization. When people are messing around, he will just call them out, right? <laughs> That's what he does. You know, he's that kind of guy who just, uh, you know, very shy, very introvert. But when you need him, he's always there. Now, seeing uh, VU and the Vienna University of Economics really positioning itself as a responsible university today is the thing to do. You might even ask, what else than being uh, or acting responsibly uh, as a manager could be an option and a North Star in a professional career. My goals for the future, in essence, continue to be to, to grow as a human being. That entails growing as a father, as a friend, as a mentor, but of course also as an entrepreneur and an activist. Thinking about the current generation of students and the young generation today, I think is nothing else than joyful. It is a generation which cares deeply about the transformation of the state of things, about a green transformation in the world, about human rights, about the societies improving into a better world. And that is deeply ingrained in them. At the same time, they are utterly capable and they really follow what they love to do. So that is wonderful and they really don't need that much advice. And of course now I would like to invite Dr. Anshula Mia Singh Bais, the chair of the International Board Amnesty, Amnesty International, to give the today's laudatory speech for Christopher Schleffer. Thank you very much for joining us today. Thank you very much. To the distinguished guests gathered here today, it is both a pleasure and a privilege to be here in person after the past two years of COVID-19. Uh, I was first in Vienna in 2018, and I fell in love with this beautiful city. As a psychologist and a classical violinist, I felt right at home with hints of Freud and Mozart everywhere. I once asked a mentor, how do you measure influence? And he responded by saying, you measure it by who will pick up your call. In other words, who will make the time? And this is the influence that Christopher Schlafer has on people. When he asked me to give this laudatory address half a year ago, I didn't look at my calendar. I simply looked at Christopher in the eye and said yes, knowing that I would bend time and space to make this work. With so much continuing death and destruction, be it the pandemic, mass migration, the climate crisis, and the war in Ukraine, nothing could be more life-affirming than celebrating people. So today, we are here to learn a little bit more about and to celebrate the son of Vienna University of Economics and Business. So Christopher received his master's degree in 1993 and that he went on to have a hugely successful, innovative and dizzying career is self-evident. From launching Android, um, you know, being CEO, founder and chairperson of Nyom, Group Chief Commercial and Digital Officer at Vion, Chief Product and Innovation Officer at Deutsche Telekom, Chief Marketing Officer at T-Mobile International, to being awarded as a Young Global Leader of the World Economic Forum, 50 Innovators to Watch, 100 Most Innovator, uh, Innovative Chief Digital Officers, to being honored with the landmark in the Land of Ideas dedicated to the digital revolution awarded by the German Federal President. But still, as one of Christopher's colleagues recounted, 
In his trademark humility, Christopher likes to point out that he was lucky having people who believed in him and never forgets to mention that no one's career happens without a bit of luck. He still often refers to himself as chief something officer. So more than one person has described his career as astonishing, yet Christopher's daughter, Catalin, is correct when she says understanding where he has come from to reach where he is today makes it even more astonishing. With a humble economic background, Christopher was raised by a single mother in a small town in Austria. He and his three younger siblings were one of the first in town to attend the gymnasium and to get a matura. While his childhood was challenged in terms of economic opportunity and his family endured many hardships, one thing that he said he always had was the love from his mother. And until today, he says it's his mother's unconditional love and belief in him, as well as her passion for education, that made him the man he is today. This is a young man who cycled through the night to get the midwife when his sister was being born, uh, traveled through a snowstorm <laughs> to be at his sister's high school dance, walked her down the aisle, and held her first child as godfather. And as his sister Gunda describes, he is the one we rely on to always be there when we need him. Now, all geniuses are a bit eclectic and eccentric, and uh, Christopher is no exception. So, one friend talked about his trying to become a professional soccer player with Christopher during childhood. And everyone can vouch that he is always the first one on the dance floor. His love for art, music, and spaghetti and one person quoted, Christopher is a man who can lead an army to war in a bevy to party as required. Another little known fact uh, about Christopher that he was a legendary lifeguard at Lake Zell and he made secret appearances as a DJ in the village discotheque called Tiffany's. <laughs> Already at 18 months, his son Albie considers him the coolest papa and man in the world. Who else would allow him to sit on his lap while driving a vintage river boat around Venice, and who else would let him have sips of Chateau Charmel with dinner? And highlighting his classic humor and penchant in building things, his daughter recalls Christopher building a vehicle out of a wooden box, and forgive my German, a so-called Seifenkist, and racing down the small hills of the village they grew up with with German cars honking at them and Christopher screaming in joy and reassuring his daughters, yeah, the Germans need to loosen up a little bit. So let me speak a little bit about trust and allyship. Um, the father of one of Christopher's best friends had a car repair shop and here was the first test drive training with the moped. Facing danger, being tough and practicing independence, pubescent Christopher set out with his younger brother and escaped from home. The destination was a neighboring hill where the brothers decided to camp. But luckily, Christopher was working in a bakery at that time and had enough bread with him. So after two full weeks of self-sufficiency, the brothers returned home, emaciated but grown in experience and full of confidence that they could overcome any situation. And even then, Christopher knew about his mother's basic confidence, and this is something that she's passed on to her children. So I am the chairperson of the world's largest preeminent Nobel Peace Prize winning global human rights organization, Amnesty International. We are a movement of over 10 million members. And this evening, um, staff members from the Amnesty International Austria office and executive director Orly are present here with us. And I think they would agree that human rights is not, it's less of something you do, it's more of a calling. Um, we at Amnesty International are less concerned about titles, but more about impact. And I became, and I serve as chair unequivocally because of Christopher. It was Christopher with his ability to see straight into the heart of an issue and quickly understanding the parameters of any situation. He suggested that I had what it takes to chair, and that is a daunting task on the best of days. And as women in this audience will well know, we, as women, face a double bind, glass, ceiling, glass ceilings and glass cliffs. 
Yet Christopher has provided countless hours of intelligence, strategy, empathy, support, and respect to me. And like his life partner, Anne rightfully says when she speaks about equality in their partnership, Christopher has in the workplace enhanced my role as chair and the international board with his capacity to retain information and seeing the wider picture in one go, which drives strategy as we take on the world's most pressing challenges. And as many of his colleagues say, it's refreshing to be able to speak to someone on equal footing, regardless of the subject matter. And as Anne shares something we have also seen in the boardroom, his quiet nature is not to be underestimated because behind that calm manner is a core of steel and his conviction to bettering the world and humanity has and will continue to move mountains. And now I come to present day. As is often said, the personal is political and the political is personal. And nothing embodies Christopher better than his newest tech venture aptly called Love. Love puts video at the heart of how people communicate. It innovates on visual expression supported by the world's leading artist and replaces a keyboard as a human machine interface. Its mission is to restore connections and transcend boundaries, a mission to build a better internet. Love aims for its product direction to be guided by its user base in a democratic fashion as opposed to having the decisions made about its future determined by a bunch of elite people at the corporate top. The company's longer term goal is ultimately to hand over ownership of the app and its governance to its users. This is, of course, a very different experience than most of us are used to, but it can be the start of something new and beautiful, a contextual internet experience that hands powers to the user and democratizes. As his co-founders and colleagues, both past and present share, Christopher deeply cares about people around him, both business partners and employees alike. He wants to collaborate with humans, not human resources. Whilst a student here at the Vienna University of Economics and Business, Christopher Heroes were on the manager of the year list that he's now being named on today. And it feels full circle today that we honor him joining the list. He is the visionary to whom you can entrust sacred things, a leader who knows how and when to follow, and who, because of the vibrant colors of his mind, will always be young. So distinguished guests, please join me in congratulating today's honoree, Christopher Schlafer. Thank you so much. I will give you a very small thank you, just to keep, you know, to remember the way of Vienna. What, what VU stands for, the Library and Learning Center and SNOW. So let's now move on to the highlight of the evening and join me in welcoming our VU manager of the year 2022, Christopher Schleffer. And because this is now very formal, I switch to German. Lieber Christopher, im Namen der WU Wien freue ich mich, dir den Titel WU Manager des Jahres 2022 überreichen zu dürfen. Wir sind wirklich wahnsinnig stolz auf dich.
I'm gonna make a change for once in my life. It's gonna feel real good, gonna make a difference, gonna make it right. As I turn up the color on, her favorite winter cold, this wind is blowing my mind. I see the kids in the street when I'm not to eat. Who am I to be blind, pretending not to see their needs? A summer's disregard, a broken battle top, and a woman soul. They followed each other on the winter you know. Cause they got nowhere to go That's why I'm starting to know I'm starting with the man in the mirror I'm asking him to change his way And no message could have been any clearer If you want to make a world a better place Take a look at yourself and then make the change Na 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 na. Whoa, whoa. I've been a victim of a selfish kind of love. It's time that I realize there are some with no home, not a nickel to loan. Could it be really me pretending that they're not alone? A willow deeply scared, somebody's broken heart, and a washed out dream. They follow the pattern on the windshield seat, cause they got no place to be. That's why I'm starting with me, I'm starting with the man in the mirror. I'm asking him to change his way. And no message could have been any clearer. If you want to make your world a better place, take a look at yourself and then make the change. I'm starting with the man in the mirror. I'm asking him to change his way. And no message could have been any clearer. If you want to make your world a better place, take a look at yourself and then make the change. I'm starting with the man in the mirror. I'm asking him to change his way. And no message could have been any clearer. If you want to make a world a better place, take a look at yourself and then make a change. Thanks, sir. Thank you, very, thank you very much, Tamara and Michael, for this wonderful piece of music. I also want to congratulate you, Christopher Schleffer, to this award, my utmost respect. My name is Michael Kötrich. I have the honor to accompany you as the host for the next few minutes. And before we start our discussion, I would like to ask you for your words and for your lecture, Christopher Schleffer. Mm. Ja, was soll man da sagen, wenn so ein warmer Regen von Zuneigung auf einen niederkommt, da ist meistens nur die Hälfte wahr, nicht? Das muss man als erstes sehen bei so einer Veranstaltung. Aber ganz im Ernst, ich danke der Wirtschaftsuniversität Wien, meiner Alma Mater für diese Auszeichnung, dir, liebe Edelfrau, als Rektorin, als die hochgeschätzte Rektorin dieses Hauses. Es ist eine Ehre, diese Auszeichnung zu, zu erhalten. An die Angela. I thank you so much for being here and for what you said and collecting together so many things you must have invested much time in from secret things from my family and friends. <laughs> Only half is true, two here, uh, but some of it is true. It was, by the way, only two days that we sustained in the wilderness, my brother and me, not two weeks, but it was <laughs> long enough, I can tell you. That's what it was. Ich bin gebeten worden, eine Vorlesung zum Thema Equality zu halten oder zu den Economics of Equality. Aber bevor ich das tue, sage ich natürlich ein paar persönliche Worte. Es 
Es ist etwas Besonderes, hier an der neuen Wirtschaftsuniversität in meinem Leben zu sein. Ich hatte meinen Schulabschluss oder Studienabschluss noch in der Augasse. Meine Großmutter war noch da, meine Mutter natürlich. Heute ist sie auch wieder da. Diese, dieser Studienabschluss war im letzten Jahrtausend von wegen jung. Und heute stehe ich wieder hier und ich stehe hier natürlich mit meiner Mutter, meiner Familie, mit meiner Partnerin, mit meinen Töchtern und mein Bub, der 18 Monate alt ist, ist zu Hause oder im Hotel und schläft. Und ich bin dankbar für die unabdingbare Liebe meiner Familie, die hat mich gestärkt. Wir waren in der Tat im Dorf die Ersten, die in eine andere Schule durften als Volksschule, Hauptschule und dann Polytechnikum und Lehre meistens, sondern Studium. Es fuhr noch nicht einmal ein Schulbus aus meinem Dorf dorthin zum Gymnasium. Ich musste früh aufstehen, 5.30 Uhr in der Regel. Und dann gab es einen langen Schulweg mit äh, auch weiten Gängen, drei, vier Kilometer zu Fuß, bevor der Schulbus fuhr in diese Schule. Und dann hat sich das alles äh, geändert. Aber Bildung ist natürlich ein Schlüssel, um teilzuhaben in einer Gesellschaft und um etwas beitragen zu können. Wir werden darauf äh, gleich kommen. Für mich war aber auch die Studienzeit rund um dieses Jahr 1989 so prägend. Der Fall des Eisernen Vorhangs für uns Europäer, die Öffnung der Welt, und die Öffnung von Möglichkeiten und viele meiner Studienkollegen haben sich damals unverändert entschieden, zu Staatsbanken in Österreich zu gehen oder ins Ministerium. Ich habe mir gedacht, nein, die Welt steht offen. Ich muss, ich muss hinaus und eigentlich wollte ich immer Politiker werden und deshalb habe ich mir in meinem ganzen Leben immer politikähnliche Rollen gesucht, also wo mein größeres Ganzes sozusagen nach vorn bewegen kann und das hat mich eigentlich immer sozusagen begleitet, dieses Thema der Verantwortung. Mein Schuldirektor hat zu mir gesagt, irgendwann kurz vor der Matura, du hast vom lieben Gott ein paar Geschenke bekommen, aber wenn du sie nicht zurückgibst, ist alles wertlos. Und recht hat er in diesem Zusammenhang. Darum geht es irgendwo im Leben. Es geht aber auch um das Neue, um die Offenheit für das Neue. Mein ganzes Leben ist von Innovation geprägt und es hält mich frisch. Ich bin jetzt... Unternehmer mit meinem vierten Unternehmen. Ich hatte auch ein Scheitern in dieser Geschichte dabei. Auch das ist eine wichtige Lernerfahrung. Aber dieses hier wird nicht scheitern und geht voraus. Und wir bauen ein kontextuelles Internet in Wahrheit, in Antwort äh, zur Markteinführung des Betriebssystems Android 2008, das die Welt tatsächlich verändert hat. Äh, die Welt, wie wir heute sozusagen Informationen verarbeiten, wie wir das Internet nutzen. Andere sitzt da, damals mein Projektleiter, für dieses riesige Projekt. Äh, es ist wichtig. Und dieses Neue und die Fortentwicklung der Welt in dieser Kombination von Neu- und Verantwortungsbewusstsein führt mich zu meiner Vorlesung. Ich bin gebeten worden, zehn Minuten eine Vorlesung zu halten. Ich habe ungefähr 170 Folien dabei, Balkendiagramme und Liniendiagramme, aber ich werde sie da durchführen, denn das Thema ist wirklich wichtig. Und ich werde in Englisch darüber sprechen. Equality to me is the most pressing issue of mankind today. It is even more pressing than fighting climate change. Because I'm very convinced that we will master climate change with our behavior and attitude, which we also see in the, already see in the world with all the innovation coming along. But the topic of equality really is there at large. And I'd like to run you today, not through the moral perspective on equality or the legal perspective on equality, But as we're here in the Vienna University of Economics through the economic lens of equality, which only serves basically as the amuse girl for the podium discussion we're going to have in a minute. Equality starts actually with the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, which reads, all human beings are born free and equal in dignity and rights. And if that was true, what a scandalous situation do we find in our world today? Because, of course, it is not the same to be born in Vienna versus Senegal or versus somewhere in another country. It just changes everything. And we are not living up to this. And this being born free and equal in dignity and rights continues without distinction of any kind, such as race, color, sex, language, religion, political or other opinion, national or social origin, property, birth or other status. These are the economic lenses we should actually apply today when we talk about equality. And I'll run through three of them. Social equality, gender equality, 
and equality from a racial point of view, to just give a few facts which hopefully feed into a good discussion. If you look at living conditions today, the mortality rate of children under the age of five is basically zero in Iceland, but is 12.7% in Somalia. Every eighth child dies in Somalia. That is 60 times more than in the developed world. If you look at the life expectancy at birth, in Japan, people on average get 84 years old. In Sierra Leone, they get 52 years old. If you look at mean years of schooling, it's one and a half years in Burkina Faso, Burkina Faso but it is 14.1 years in Germany. Ten times more schooling in the Western world than in the developing world. Expected years of schooling, same ratio. If you look at the average income, which is on a purchasing power parity rate, so it's already calculated that we have different economic environments, around 54,000 US dollars in the US and 600 in the Central African Republic, which is a multiple of almost 100. 100 times less or more right, than the average numbers. That's where we start the discussion. So if you look a bit closer into social equality or inequality, you can first of all see hope. Here is a coefficient we use in economics. It's the Gini coefficient measuring the dispersity of income or wealth. You can apply it for both dimensions. And you see that the world, basically with the Industrial Revolution, has become more unequal. So zero would be here very good. Zero would be equal. But we started from 1820 to really become an unequal planet. And that leveled out somewhere in 1920, stayed the same. But the good news is, since two decades, we have improving equality across the world. And that is, of course, a consequence, for instance, of the United Nations working on the Millennium Goals and the Sustainable Development Goals and so many action around global imbalances, uh, that this is, you know, proving to be better, and that is the global uh, space. The issue, however, is that inside societies, equality is deteriorating. And we can look at that in a very complicated chart. I promised there's 170 complicated charts. I'm going to run you through that. That is basically the distribution of wealth now. On the left-hand side is the distribution of poorest, and on the right-hand side of richest. And if you just look to the right-hand side, it's of course North America and Europe, but increasingly China, which has the rich you know, human beings on Earth. And China is moving to the right-hand side in the last 30 years with basically pulling more than 400 million people out of poverty. It's a miraculous achievement, actually, if you look at China. But the question really is, where does sub-Saharan Africa go in that equation? In India, you can see that India is following China. Uh, so these are the signs, basically, you see in that regard. Now, if you look into the social cohesion of societies inside them, we see a very difficult pattern. Because although the overall equality around the world is improving, inside the societies, there's an extreme concentration of wealth in the hands of a few, and almost no wealth in the hands of the many. If you look at that chart, 1% of the world's population owns 46% of our wealth. 1% of people owns 46% of the wealth. And 55% of the global population altogether only own 1% of the wealth. That is the dramatic polarization in that world. And you see that pattern basically in every also national economy. And that is not sustainable for the social cohesion basically of ecosystems. You can Go into that, because you might ask, why is that bad? We have a market economy, it's nice if you're successful and you accumulate capital. But the issue here is an interesting one. You see the blue line here, which is the share of the top 0.1%, so of one per mil of society in German, and it is rising, skyrocketing. So one out of thousands, they really accumulate the wealth, whilst we are failing to tax them fairly. So the tax rate, which is the orange curve, goes down. And that is the issue of unfairness in a society, because if we had a fair tax system, we could, of course, reallocate the means and basically progress society in this regard. And that is an income view. If you 
and now we have a U.S. chart here, look at the share of what the wealthy pay in tax. They pay 5% of tax, whilst they have almost 10% of wealth. So they should actually be taxed twice as high. This is the curve. And at the same time, whilst the wealth of the super-rich has been tripling since the 1960s, the wealth of the 50% bottom of society has halved in these 50 years, but the tax burdens on the super wealthy has stayed the same. It's also on corporations. The share of corporations in being, paying tax in the US has come down in the last 70 years from 32% contribution to tax payments in the US to only 6.6% of tax contributions. So corporations are avoiding tax, of course, and whilst the nominal tax rate in the US is at 21%, the real taxation is much lower because the tax system, in essence, needs to be renovated uh, in that regard. If you do a mental experiment and would say that the taxation of corporations in the US would actually be at 28%, which the Biden government has suggested, and you might be familiar with all the discussions around the harmonized tax system in the world, the OECD scheme, etc. So if we could successfully do that, the US would dispose of additional funds of almost one trillion US dollars, which could fund home care with good jobs for caregivers entirely, building and retrofitting two million US homes, universal preschool for every child in the US, and free community college. Just this little twist, which is nothing extraordinary, would totally change the game for education and the social mobility of people, because education is the key, of course, in fighting inequality. And here is education. Education, of course, is not only a US topic or an Austrian topic or a German topic. It is a global topic. And you see Mariem's uh, girls that we always say, in Kakuma in a refugee camp, which they will never leave. 200,000 people with traumatic pasts gathered in a refugee camp from all kinds of things. And here's a solution for them. It is education with digital means. So we need to do something to really unleash that power. So that was social. I'm going to be fast on gender and race because it is so clear what we see. If you look at the gender equality, it is very interesting, again in the US, the participation of women is scarce at the top. Only 8% of company leaders in the US are women, 92% are men. But women have a 67% share in minimum wage jobs. So they really pushed into a precarious state in that regard, and that is of course also a polarization you cannot sustain as a society. The gender pay gap has narrowed, that is true, but still in the US, every hour of a female worker is only 80% worth of what a male worker has, and it's still just a huge problem. And thirdly, and you see that then over a lifetime, the median retirement sav savings of men versus women are totally disproportionate. Whilst men have roughly 123,500 US dollars in retirement savings, women in the US have $42,000 in retirement savings. What a social scandal we have produced with the payment schemes we have and the dignity, frankly, also in living. And you see it very clearly. I could add 160 other charts on the gender inequality. And the last part is race and the racial focus in that regard. The wealth divide in the US, and it's just a proxy for all other societies, but we crystallize it the most in the US, has just grown in the last three decades. It's always a comparison between 1989, when the wall came down and the internet was founded by Sir Tim Berners-Lee, and 2019. And whilst the average white family has a wealth in the US of 183,600 US dollars, the average black family has only 13% of that, 87% lower. The average Latino family has only 19% of white families. So there is a gap which is so wide, 
which speaks for itself what we have done in terms of racial equality. If you look at families and their likelihood to have absolutely no wealth, zero or even negative because they indebted, the likelihood to have no wealth for black and Hispanic families is somewhere between 28 and 26 percent, whilst white families have only a likelihood of around 15 percent. So there is an extreme also gap in terms of being exposed to you know, uh, life-threatening economic situations. And if you look at employment, the unemployment rate of black and Hispanic segments in the US society, again, is almost twice as high pre-COVID, post-COVID, and that is what happens in our economic society. So, just a few facts. And now what to do? We will not solve this tonight. But there's a few questions, which I at least added. And the fun fact here is when I typed this in in the morning in my computer, my son Albi uh, came awake, and he likes typing also on the computer, so he contributed the title here, uh, <laughs> which is dash bracket bracket backslash O P. Uh, maybe it stands for options. <laughs> the questions I think we need to ask ourselves, and I conclude with that before we come to the discussion, is first of all, how can the global economy transform towards a more equitable trade system? Trade is so important for us, right? So that we can really use all the resources on the planet in an equitable way. Secondly, how can a fairer and more harmonized tax system fund overcoming the global social imbalances? Why on earth is income tax on employment of a worker twice as high as capital gains tax of a billionaire somewhere? There are things which need to be just corrected in this regard. Thirdly, is free access to education in a digital world, and even a typo is here, in essence a human right? Fourthly, do we need to regulate actually the market economy to guarantee economical, social and cultural equality in some way? And fifth, and most importantly, and I always stumble myself over that, how can we change our attitudes? It's incredible how we kind of stick to our biases, how we are grown up, how I myself fight my own biases all the time and how I'm not clear and neutral enough versus things. And I think this is the most important part, that we open our eyes, having it so comfortable here in Vienna and in the Western world, and just see how the world looks like in charts or in real, and then think about what we can do to balance out and come to a more equal society. Thank you very much. Thank, thank you very much, Christopher. And I may invite my guests to the podium for our panel discussion on how can we build a fairer society. And I have the honor to introduce my guests. I, want to, I would like to start with Professor Karin Heitzmann. She is an associate professor at the Institute of Social Policy at the Department of Socioeconomics, and she is director of the Research Institute Economics of Inequality. And after finishing the doctoral studies in Vienna, she worked for the World Bank in Washington, D.C. Very warm welcome. It's nice that you can be here with us tonight. Then I would like to introduce Rem Kohlhaas. He's one of the world's most renowned architects, architectural theorist and urbanist. Uh, he's a writer of many books. There's one book, Delirious New York, which some of you might know. And he was the director of the Architecture Biennale in 2014. And his extraordinary research work on the countryside was presented at the Guggenheim Museum two years ago. Maybe we can talk about that later. And Saha Hadid, uh, that was mentioned before, was the architect of this very building where we can be tonight. Very warm welcome to Rem Kohlhaas. <laughs> we have seen her already on the stage, Dr. Angela Mia Singh Bays. She is an internationally renowned psychologist and global chair of Amnesty International. She obtained her PhD with distinction of the Chicago School of Professional Psychology. And before that, she started as a model and has strutted 
the runways around the globe. And like Christopher, uh, she was named the Young Global Leader by the World Economic Forum. Welcome to our podium. <laughs> Yeah, and of course, we have Christopher on our podium. Welcome. It's, it's a pleasure having you Thank here. You. How can we build a fairer society? That's what we want to discuss in the next minutes. And Dr. Bayes, I would like to, to start with you. As a chair of um, Amnesty International, you must come across inequality in any shape and in any form. What are the most pressing issues uh, from your perspective? Well, that's a million dollar question and a very broad <laughs> question. Um, you know, when I think about inequality, I think about how much it's been in our face because of the COVID-19 pandemic. Inequality is not by chance, it is by choice. And the havoc that has wreaked, um, you know, uh, Christopher in just in his lecture and his presentation spoke a little bit about race and how many more black people died from COVID-19 because of essentially vaccine apartheid. When Christopher was speaking about the sort of gender pay gap and how it's lessened, who do you think bore the brunt of, you know, child care, school from home, lockdowns, women? Um, their careers have regressed severely because of um, COVID-19. And we know that with inequality, uh, indigenous, racialized uh, people and, and women um, suffer disproportionately. So, you know, when we think about this sort of UN uh, sustainable goals, we have really been set back, even with uh, what's happening with children's educational obtainment, um, the sort of results that we'll see longitudinally. So th this is sort of front of mind. And, you know, of course, at Amnesty, we want to do less better, but what we're eyeing is, you know, um, taxation policy, uh, we had a lot of campaigns and work on um, the COVID inequality and um, even doctors who were very brave and uh, in the front line and, and calling out uh, government suppression and how they were jailed. So we, we've been covering all these topics and uh, this is what keeps me up at night. There were so many issues, but could you, could you explain one of, of the solutions for one of those issues? Well, like Christopher said, we're not going to solve anything tonight. So um, in terms of solutions, I don't actually prefer to use that word. I, I think maybe a more agile, appropriate word is um, deep adaptation and agility. I, I mean, I think solution can be a red herring and gives us a, a sort of a, a false hope. And like, you know, it's a panacea. It, it kind of reminds me with the climate crisis, people thinking we can seed the sky with things and make it rain and block this and it'll be fine. And it's sort of a fool's paradise. Um, well, what are we known for in Amnesty? Calling out the bad guys and putting, you know, um, I was doing a, a team building session with Asia Pacific executive directors and chairs recently in Bangkok of the, our Amnesty offices there. And they're, you know, we were doing a self-reflecting exercise and they're like, what do governments think of amnesty? I'm like, well, depending on how they behave, we're either their ally or their worst nightmare come true. And I have no problem being that. Um, so put to bear like pressure on governments and our, our, our absolute strength is that we, are, um, we can mobilize. We are a movement of 10 million people. And a lot of times when I speak with people, let's say a stay-at-home parent or a young person, Let's be honest, there's compassion fatigue. Look at the headlines, right, of, of your public, anywhere. There's so much going on and, you know, people have analysis paralysis and they're like, what can I do? Well, let's think about it from a climate perspective for a second. If every single person in this room took a five-minute shower instead of 10 minutes, collectively, how much water do we save, right? So it's drip by drip, drop by drop, um, these crises were long in the coming. They were created over many years. I know time is running out, but we also live in an age of insta everything and it's unrealistic. So keep fighting the good fight. Governments, I also think we need, everybody needs to be in this from a stay at home 
parent to private public partnerships and um, I'm, I'm confident that we can. It's not intractable. From being so globally, let's get a bit more local. Professor Herzmann, you have recently published a major piece on social investment in Austrian poverty politics. Can you tell us what are your major findings? Um, well, poverty, as you know, is a problem that has a lot to do with a lack of income. Um, and what we do know about poverty um, is that um, what Christopher was also referring to, um, that social mobility is not very high. So we have something that we call um, an inherited poverty, so, which means that um, poor children are becoming the poor parents of yet again poor children of tomorrow. Um, and within the social policy sphere, there's a lot of discussion about inequality and how to, to tackle that. And one approach, one perspective is to increase social investments into people, um, which means uh, trying to break this transmission of poverty. And one of the main measures that it's incorporated in this perspective is indeed education and qualification and employment as pathways out of this poverty cycle and, and ways or possibilities to break this transmission of poverty. And what um, I was looking at um, in Austria is um, in how far our country has indeed um, incorporated this um, social investment perspective in policies. And I was looking into poverty policies, um, especially social assistance policies. And as you might know, um, Austria has a, a system where federal provinces, we have nine federal provinces, can decide um, autonomously, more or less, um, about the legislation on social assistance. And uh, my research found that um, there are big differences um, concerning the implementation of social investment depending on where you live. <laughs> and so some uh, legislation um, kind of uh, takes care of education and qualification as a, as a priority before integrating people into the labor market, um, thereby stressing that it's uh, more a case of um, integrating people sustainably into employment rather than integrate them in any job <laughs> without um, much future. So there's a lot of variation in Austria. Can such uh, policy response be applied more globally too? Um, Yes, I think so. That the social investment perspective is uh, something that is very much um, favored and discussed by institutions such as the European Commission, but also the OECD, who um, wants to, to um, convince welfare states to focus on this type of um, policies, which is very much policies of education, of qualification, of making people especially um, people from disadvantaged regions or disadvantaged families to, to become employable or to, to increase their employability. Hmm. Christopher Schleffer, you told us many interesting things. Uh, what would you expect from politics around the world to tackle those crises <laughs> you mentioned? Well, I think uh, I have hinted at the the red threats I would politics expect to, to pick up. It is, of course, social trade or no, global trade. Mm -hmm. We have been seeing a breakdown of multilateralism recently in, in this decade, right? And picking this up not in the old way in the 1980s and 1990s, just producing pure globalism, uh, but, but a more equitable you know, trade system, I think, is one of the strengths. And I, I seriously believe in tax reform. We just have been seeing economies and nation states using tax as a weapon, right, to, to fight each other instead of just produce a level playing field um, for companies and for individuals across the globe. And then, of course, also balancing out, uh, you know, how individuals who are dependent on a work income are taxed vis-a-vis -vis those who are really accumulating wealth and reinvesting in wealth and benefiting from all of these systems. It is interesting that tax plays such a role down to that amnesty even starts to you know, um, engage uh, themselves into tax questions, which is a new uh, you know, dimension for human rights movement, but it's, it's in essentially necessary. 
And then, of course, in, in a polarizing political environment, especially in Europe, where you know uh, voters seem to not go left or right anymore, but rather into the center or to the extreme outside, we need to really have a huge debate on also education, information, and prejudice and bias. What we find in our societies uh, uh, in terms of bias, especially vis-a-vis -vis the unknown and vis-a-vis -vis something which is outside our national boundaries, is, is just not bearable. And uh, that is really also the root of <clears throat> all these global misunderstandings and how we deal with conflict and how we look at Ukraine versus Russia uh, with uh, you know, our white uh, glasses um, neglecting West Gray and what happens in the Democratic Republic of Hong Congo or the banal discussion we almost have around China and the US and decoupling as opposed to you know, having an informed debate. Mm. Let's move on to architecture. Um, there are many examples where architecture played a major role in tackling inequality, uh, like in the former Soviet Union or even in Vienna with the Gemeindebau. Um, is architecture actually a powerful tool to overcome inequality? Um, <clears throat> it's uh, certainly true that in the, in the beginning of the 20th century, there were... Uh, uh, large groups of architects who were actually interested, who were socialists or, or communists, and who were therefore uh, interested in uh, basing an architecture on equality. And I have to admit that uh, my reason to become an architect uh, was uh, seeing in the Soviet Union in 1965 uh, a project of the um, 20s, that was the most literal uh, representation of equality I've ever seen. It abandoned cities and basically through the beautiful countryside there would be uh, a, a continuous ribbon of individual rooms and every single citizen of the Soviet Union would have a room. It would be off the ground, uh, there would be a little staircase and you could be alone in your room and if you had a partner he could be next to you or she could be next to you. If you had a kid, the kid could also have a room. And that was such a kind of incredibly stark, but, but also appealing, or, or not to say seductive, uh, image of uh, equality that, you know, basically it, it made me um, turn, turn away from uh, different careers. Uh, but that was in 67 and... <clears throat> Of course, already 15 years later, we were in a totally different uh, uh, situation. Socialism was, uh, in a way, um, considered uh, out of date. Uh, communism um, collapsed, and the market economy became the kind of great, huge arbiter of everything. And I think um, um, that then can basically cancel any connection that my profession might have with uh, equality, equality because you know, there was simply no client or, or no user who would be kind of still interested in that literal uh, evidence of equality as you know both uh, an, an ideological um, idea but also as a kind of physical uh, reality. But today, is, is uh, architecture a powerful tool to overcome inequality in a, in a certain way? I think what I'm trying to say is that uh, architecture has ceased to be a powerful tool of anything. Uh, because uh, through the market economy, we, were, we used to work for the public sector. You know, and, and if you work for the public sector, you can at least have uh, an illusion that you're working for the good of mankind. Uh, what happened, you know, since Reagan and Thatcher, we are working more and more for the private sector, and that means we are working for private interests, sometimes reasonably positive, but very often kind of simply extremely egotistical and 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 uh, ideological. So I think that, you know, it lost whatever power it had. It lost um, very thoroughly uh, in the last twenty years. I would say. Mm. There was this, this wonderful exhibition at Guggenheim Museum in, in New York two years ago on the countryside. What is the different 
on the countryside when it comes to inequality? Or is uh, the well, countryside an, an elegant for urban living? Well, I think that um, th th there's something in the air, um, e even tonight, uh, which I think is kind of very interesting. What the countryside exhibition was, was an uh, in investigation in the differences, uh, different conditions in every part of the world uh, in the countryside. We looked at Russia, we looked at China, we looked at the Middle East, we looked at Africa. And uh, what I think is uh, extremely important, uh, was an, for me a very important uh, conclusion, which I want to kind of really pursue also in uh, a second version of it, is that no condition is comparable. Uh, and, and so, for instance, if in your statistics, um, it is very noticeable that Africa is kind of in every category uh, on the bottom. Nevertheless, I would prefer to be born in an African village than in an Icelandic village. <laughs> and and, and that, that's a kind of very important kind of feeling because there is uh, an immense intelligence, immense creativity, immense activity in Africa that I think somehow in, in the kind of way in which we discuss uh, these more or less political issues never um, is never captured or very difficult to capture. So um, I think that uh, what is uh, for me slightly alarming is that we are discussing as if there are uh, recipes or solutions or um, models that have uh, uh, kind of relevance or applicability in almost every condition. And uh, if any, if I learned anything for, of this countryside zooms, uh, is that each condition is extremely uh, different, extremely unique, and and can kind of requires its own uh, intelligence. Mm. Uh, Dr. Bayes, and so therefore, I think that you know. We, we are typically bemoaning the, the regression of globalization. I think there's also kind of a very legitimate part of it where kind of somehow there is a kind of sense that each uh, different condition needs to be kind of seen and kind of regarded uh, on its own before we can uh, kind of reconsider uh, the, the kind of more universal kind of situation. Uh, Dr. Base, there's one topic I would like to to mention. It's it's racism. racism. Um, you uh, showed with your organization, with Amnesty International, uh, that uh, you, one can uh, tackle the the structural racism. What can other organizations learn from from that, from from your organization? Well, first I would start off by saying um, we learn from each other. So uh, I think one of the most helpful things as global chair is when I uh, get on calls with other global chairs from you know, the Oxfam global chair, Greenpeace, CARE, um, that peer-to-peer -peer learning, and, and that's, that's what we try to do as an organization. It's about knowing when to lead from the front, knowing when to lead from the, you know, from the back. Um, and I think humility is a key part you know, we have some of the most brilliant, um, brightest minds in Amnesty <clears throat> in terms of just everything, uh, advocacy campaigns, our researchers, our executive directors. But humility is key. We, we, I mean, what are organizations and institutions if not created and populated by people? We don't always get it right. And I, I think, you know, when I stepped onto the international board and then subsequently became chair, you know, Amnesty is founded by lawyers, and it, that inculcates a particular mindset, which is obviously needed at times. But I am the first psychologist to chair, and I think that contributes something different. Um, I want us to be a learning organization, so it's you know, the process guides, and I, I agree, I agree with you. It's not solutions; it's an iterative process, and it's fluid, and it guides us, and we're listening, and we're learning. <clears throat> and we need to think about intersectionality. The, the, the whole international board is getting ready to do uh, 12 weeks of uh, feminist leadership training. And I don't think, uh, I'm just checking to see if my board member is excited. Okay. Uh, <laughs> um, the most pretend, feminist Christopher, leader. Christopher, pretend. <laughs> but um, we, we can't silo it, right? Uh, so the intersectionality of it, um, and, and getting clear, I think, you know, we, there's a lot of, 
social media faffing around in buzzwords of the moment. <laughs> it's like every every employer says, you know, equal opportunity uh, on LinkedIn. What does that really mean? So, and having these hard conversations and creating those spaces and. That can be a tall order when you have so many diverse, brilliant minds in the room, but um, this iteration of the international board is not afraid to be bold, and um, we will tackle it head on. Mm. Time is flying by, so we're going to have a last round. Some of our guests are politicians, some of them are managers. We all are human beings acting and interacting. So I would like each of you, what can each and every person do in contributing to building a fairer and more just society? Maybe let's start with you, Christopher. Well, I, I repeat the bias thing, really, you know, uh, reflecting yourself where you are with the attitudes. Even this discussion again, when Rem says, I'd rather be born in Africa, it's exactly true, right? Even the numbers are biased, right? Um, because you have only one lens on that. And it's a dramatically difficult individual process to overcome your own biases. Um, and it's a lifelong learning journey for all of us. Thank you very much. Angela Bates. Uh, just building on what Christopher said, when, when you're in graduate school as a psychologist, um, you know, they ask you, why do you want to be a psychologist? It's easier to help and heal other people or as an activist to save the world. But it's much harder to understand yourself, know thyself quite literally. And, and exactly right, understanding your biases and, and um, blind spots and what you're bringing to the table. So if you can do that and have these conversations around the dining table, public transport, dialogue, 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 and uh, we will all evolve as a society. Thank you. Rem well, Kurhas. Um, the first time I used the word economy was in 1983. Uh, before that, uh, I never used the word and never thought about it. Uh, and now we're sitting here, and I think that all of us have used the word wealth uh, already more than one time. Um, I really have a feeling that the, the through the market economy, we are too obsessed with money and too obsessed with uh, well with wealth and the distribution of wealth, and that. Uh, one, th we should try to unlearn that habit and see how and with, in which other categories we can be, we, we, from which we can derive happiness. And there are, I know that there are many. Thank you. Karin Heitzman. Um, um, well, along these lines, really, um, I think um, for oneself to broaden someone's or oneself's perspective, to understand the multiple dimensions and also perspectives of all of these issues, and the second issue too, as you said before, enter into the discourse, which is very often a normative discourse. <laughs> um, and yeah, try to um, jointly come, I use the word again, solution, come to a solution or a step forward at least. Thank you very much. As you predicted, we couldn't solve all problems of, <laughs> of the world, but we tried to. Thank you very much for my guests here on the podium, and uh, thank you for all your insights. And the closing words are up to you, Professor Hannah Becker. Thank you. Well, thank you very much. Thank you very much for the, the beginning of this discussion, of course, and the, uh, the initiative thoughts you shared with us. Thank you all very much for joining us for this, I think, very important evening, not only because we have this wonderful VU alumni with us, but also to have the chance to come together and to uh, go on uh, discussing, but now in a more, let's say, in a less formal setting. So I would officially close now the formal event and would invite you all joining us for a glass of wine, glass of uh, water or juice to, of course, uh, I don't know, hug and kiss our VU manager of the year 2022. <laughs> but finally, of course, I'm very happy that we, uh, as a very final, are once again listening to our VU talent, Tamara. Thank you very much. And the reception will be then outside. Thank you. Thank you.
Imagine there's no heaven It's easy if you try No hell below us Above us only sky Imagine all the people living for today. You imagine there's no countries. It isn't hard to do. Nothing to kill or die for And no religion to Imagine all the people Living life in peace You may say I'm a dreamer, but I'm not the only one. I hope someday you will join us, and the world will be as one. Imagine no possession. I wonder if you can No need for greed or hunger A brotherhood of man Imagine all the people Sharing But I'm not the only one I hope someday you will join us And the world will live as one Dankeschön.